Uh, so welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Marta Piekarska. Uh, as you could see, I'm director of ecosystem for Hyperledger in the Linux Foundation. And I will explain a bit later what does that mean and why do we have that weird system. Um, I've been about four years in the blockchain space. They say that blockchain space, so we have to count the years in blockchain uh, like donkey years, so it's times seven. So I guess I've been, what, 28 years now, which is only one year shorter than I've been living in general. So um, that's it. Um, I will give you a brief overview of uh, what Linux Foundation is and how does it tie to Hyperledger or how Hyperledger ties to it. And then we'll go into a bit more detail of what people do with uh, blockchain. How many of you have familiarity with blockchain? Okay, so for for amount there, great. So let's start with that. Um, you probably ask people that are dealing more with big data and uh, data analysis, no Linux Foundation. Uh, Linux Foundation is much more than just Linux. Uh, we were actually set up 16 years ago uh, to uh, bring enterprises together and help them work and collaborate on uh, various projects uh, that deliver open source solutions. Uh, we provide the governance, the marketing, PR support, legal infrastructure. Uh, we ourselves don't develop any code. Uh, we are kind of that big house that hosts all of the projects. What started with Core Linux 16 years ago, today grew to 50 different projects. And um, okay, how many of you know Kubernetes? Okay, so this is a Linux Foundation project. Uh, Node.js, uh, similarly a Linux Foundation project. But also we have projects you've never heard about probably, like um, the automotive-grade Linux. Uh, actually, most of BMWs use uh, automotive-grade Linux. Uh, and we also have a drone project, which I kind of, I don't know, I'm very excited about it. Um, so two years ago, people started coming to us and saying, hey, you know, have you heard about this whole thing called Bitcoin? And Jim Zemlin, our executive director at Linux Foundation, said, uh, yeah, I do read newspapers. So, of course, I heard about Bitcoin. Uh, but then the question was, what does Linux Foundation want to do with, um, with uh, uh, Bitcoin? And we said, Bitcoin does not fit the model that... Uh, works well uh, with Linux Foundation. It doesn't have, we couldn't be able to create a project that will help bring the enterprises together to collaborate uh, on an open source framework. However, the underlying technology, blockchain, uh, has a, a very huge, a very big potential. So Hyperledger was set up as an open source collaborative effort to advance the cross industry blockchain technologies. Uh, and of course, we are a Linux project, uh, which basically uh, kind of provides the um, infrastructure, the, um, the governance model for companies that want to develop uh, blockchain-based frameworks. What is important is that we focus on um, enterprise-grade blockchains, so not the public permission-less ones, uh, but rather on the ones that can really help enterprises. And today, we started off um, two years ago, as I said, with 30 companies. Uh, today, we are 250 different mem corporate members and an unknown number of open source developers that just contribute to the project. And they, you really have applications in every major industry. So what is the vision of Hyperledger? We really think that blockchain promises to change the way that businesses are conducted, but there will not be one blockchain to rule them all. Uh, if you hope that I'll tell you now that Ethereum will die and only Hyperledger fabric will win or something like that. No, this is not the case. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, uh, Hyperledger frameworks, Corda, Quorum, all of these frameworks will coexist, uh, we hope so at least, to help enterprises. Uh, and similar to Linux Foundation, we decided coming from the premise that there won't be one blockchain to rule them all, uh, to uh, 
use that greenhouse uh, co uh, concept. So in Linux, in Linux Foundation, we have a greenhouse of ideas for different projects in every major industry. In Hyperledger, we are the community stewardship and the technological, legal and marketing, as I said, kind of um, flight controllers, if you will. But anyone can come to us and say, I have an idea. Can I plant it in your greenhouse? And if the community takes it up and wants to develop it, as with any open source uh, project out there, we will obviously be very happy to ho host it. We started off with two projects. It was Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth. Today we have uh, five different frameworks and five different tools. Um, we, uh, I guess, briefly just can tell you that um, these frameworks are differentiate in the governance model and the uh, consensus mechanisms that they use. Uh, and they all can be applied very broadly. So Hyperledger Borrow is an implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine uh, on uh, Tendermint. So it strips down the token side of things, it strips down the currency, and looks at the Ethereum smart contracts and uh, virtual machine and how this can be applied to enterprises. And Borrow is now actually actually being collab or collaborating and being moduled out so that it, you can actually write so that these smart contracts both on Hyperledger Fabric and Hyperledger Sawtooth. Hyperledger Fabric might be our most famous project um, that uh, has been going on. It's now in almost in version 1.2. It will be released very soon. It supports both uh, Ethereum Solidity smart contracts and the um, chain code, which is a native, uh, uh, native code that was written for Fabric. Uh, all Fabric is written in uh, Go, uh, out of our languages, though now you can write your business side of logic in other languages like Java and JavaScript. Uh, it uses a consensus mechanism called um, uh, Kafka, uh, which is a crash fault tolerant consensus. Uh, Hyperledger Indy is our, the community's response to uh, identity issue. I'm not sure if you're aware of the fact that 1.3 billion people in the world do not have any kind of identity document. Um, that's uh, mostly uh, leads to uh, things like human trafficking and not being able to identify people. This also leads to problems uh, whenever you're subject to crime, you can't report that because countries don't recognize you. And if you flee a country, uh, obviously all of your education, all of your background is lost because we are basing it on documents that are paper documents that you just want to uh, destroy. So Indy looks at how can we store private information and deliver identity solutions uh, through the blockchain that will be immutable, because that's one of the biggest uh, things about uh, blockchain, but also in a safe and secure way. Um, Indy is also used by the government of Philippines, which I'll talk a bit more about, and uh, some projects with uh, Know Your Clients and banking. Then we have Hyperledger Iroha which is a project uh, coming mostly from the uh, Asian countries uh, where they are focusing on mobile payments and very lightweight applications. Uh, Iroha is written in C++ because we really needed tight memory control uh, and it is really uh, very lightweight, very uh, applicable. And then finally, we have Hyperledger Sawtooth, which is our uh, second production ready code. Uh, Hyperledger Sawtooth um, uses a very interesting um, consensus mechanism called POET, proof of elapsed time, uh, that executes the consensus in the trusted execution environment uh, and is kind of a turnaround from Bitcoin uh, consensus, the proof of work, where uh, here, you, the person that, or the, the entity that uh, gets to put things on the blockchain is the one that wins lottery by being allocated the least amount of time, execution uh, time. So instead of putting a lot of energy and a lot of effort into finding a solution to the riddle, which uh, effectively proof of work is, the poet does the opposite. It says, who will spend the least amount of time on things? 
Um, and then we have tools. Uh, Cello, Composer, and Explorer are three tools that allow you to deploy, investigate, and analyze what is happening on your blockchain. And then Caliper is a benchmarking platform, which everyone got really excited about. It's our youngest project because it really allows you to stress test your networks. And finally, Hyperledger Quilt coming from uh, NTT and Ripple. It is the interledger protocol implementation in Java. So as I mentioned, uh, we kind of decided when we started Hyperledger that we strongly believe that blockchain is not cryptocurrency. Actually, blockchain technology has been um, around for much longer than Bitcoin itself. First mentionings of uh, blockchain and timestamping with uh, blockchain are from the 60s. Cypherpunks uh, wrote their manifesto in um, 90, I believe, 2, 93, uh, proclaiming ideas that were built, uh, were built on top or helped to build Bitcoin. Um, that cryptocurrency is an application that sits on top of blockchain, but on top of blockchain, we can put many more things. So, because this talk is not very long, uh, I figured that I'll put this slide up. And if you Google these 25 words, I promise you, and remember what they mean, obviously, um, I promise you that you can hold a fairly normal con or informed conversation with people in this space. Um, it is about consensus mechanism. It is about security and cryptography. So there are some some concepts that there are obviously, you know, very well known. Zero knowledge proofs are in maths known for ages. SHA-256, of course, as well. Then there are, of course, ledger concepts like mining, blocks, forks uh, that are very confusing because we don't have a common language or common tra um, translations of those things, so people get confused. And for, of course, we have very specific platform co concepts like nodes, oracles, or uh, smart contracts. Um, wh why enterprises really want blockchain? Because it provides that transparency, immutability, and uh, really security. By 2025, the World Economic Forum predicts that 10% of global GDP will be assets tracked uh, on uh, and distributed uh, on the blockchain. Um, the block business blockchain technologies uh, provide a very interesting um, platform for uh, storing information, for distributing information, but also depending on how you deal with it, you have different features that you can leverage. So you probably have heard about the permissioned and permissionless blockchains and public and private. The differences are very simple. In terms of permission versus permissionless, it is who can write to a blockchain. So imagine this conference, right? This is a permissioned blockchain conference, if you will, because we all had to register and buy tickets. We need a permission to enter this room, right? Uh, but uh, it, if you look at public versus private, it is about who can read from a blockchain. Information during this conference will be distributed over uh, the internet, anyone will be able to download it without even prior registration. We will not track who is looking at that information, right? So this is why it's a public uh, conference. Now, in terms of blockchain and coming back to that, the question would be, you know, why do you need permission or permissionless blockchain? Well, I like to give the other side of spectrum example, uh, medical records. It is a very popular case that uh, Blockchain is nowadays used for sharing and storing medical information uh, because of the attestations that you can make to it and the security of it. However, if I would tell you that uh, anyone here can access my medical data and, you know, you didn't quite like my talk, so you'll add a bit of hepatitis C to my records. Well, that doesn't really work, right? I want to keep that information private. Also, only certain people should be simply able to see if I have that hepatitis or not, right? It's my private information. And that's why m medical records are being used on a permissioned 
private network, network of hospitals, doctors and patients. Um, but then there's middle ground. So, for instance, land titles or university degrees, where anyone should be able to check if I do hold a PhD from Technical University of Berlin, uh, because I made a claim like that. But only Technical University of Berlin, obviously, should be able to issue that certificate and say that I passed the exams, right? So that's the, the ground. Now, the blockchain has... Uh, blockchain technologies have been uh, adopted by almost every industry today. But if you look at the you know, famous uh, diffusion of innovation curve, um, it is different stages. So financial technologies are definitely in the innovator space. They jumped on it very early on, and not necessarily for cryptocurrencies. I would say that cryptocurrencies are the least uh, popular uh, application in f fintech. It's more for the uh, reconciliation on a blockchain of transactions and real-time transactions. Then we have um, things like supply chain or healthcare, which uh, I would say are the early adopters. To, in 2018, we are seeing more and more actual deployments rather than just proof of concepts. And then we have uh, the logistics, insurance, and government, which are just catching up. But they are catching up in an extreme speed. There are 203 different uh, implementations of blockchain technologies in government space all over the world. Uh, Netherlands, um, Smart Dubai or Dubai, uh, Singapore, Estonia, obviously, are the leading countries there where in Smart Dubai, which is one of the members of Hyperledger, we, uh, they have identified 23 different citizen stories or applications. And by 2020, they are planning to move everything that has to do with citizens on a blockchain. So all information, the way that you process information, also things like um, payment gateways, all of this goes through blockchain. But to be honest, I mean, you know, I'm very hyped about uh, blockchain in some ways, but I'm the last person to tell you that blockchain will solve your, all of your problems. I really like this XKCD because we, as technologists, as engineers, tend to get overexcited about uh, engineering and about algorithms, and we want to sprinkle that on everything. Well, it doesn't work that way. Some problems are much bigger and harder. Uh, and we need that um, uh, cold shower sometimes to understand that. As I mentioned, you know, uh, we launched two years ago. We are a very growing community. There are ways to become engaged with Hyperledger that do not require, or actually everything in Hyperledger is completely open source. And it is not pay to play. So you can, can go download the code today, start deploying with it, playing around and so on. Uh, we have active community working groups. If you're not that technical, you can come and join us on calls uh, about healthcare, about performance and scalability, uh, about uh, gov public sector applications. I'm currently working with a team, and please let me know if you're interested in social impact of blockchain, because uh, we are trying to find uh, places there. And of course, identity is one of the bigger ones. Um, just in a matter of time, I'll skip these slides and go already here, um, because that's more interesting. What are people doing with blockchain? Why, why are they so interested and excited about it? First of all, uh, we see a spectrum of industry use cases, uh, because there is a need for decentralization, trust, and con uh, continuity uh, that confirms over time. Now, one important thing is that to recognize that there is a difference between decentralization and distribution. Systems like the distributed ledger technologies can be or should be uh, distributed, so it should be spread out across different servers, across different platforms. But there is quite often a certain need for centralization uh, on a blockchain for governance purposes. You have to, sometimes you have nodes that are stronger than the others. Um, and I know this is something that is extremely controversial because in uh, 
Bitcoin space, you have truly decentralized distributed system. But for enterprises, you very often need a certain level of governance because things go wrong. I mean, we've seen it already that uh, wallets get hacked, that uh, people lose money in DAO. And how do you revert back? That's only can be done through some kind of a governance and agreement process. Um, one of the first implementations that we've seen was interstate medical licensing, where the challenge was uh, to share information about licenses uh, and claims uh, uh, adjudicated Adjudicate ah, <laughs> claims processes uh, that is uh, that needs increased transparency uh, and trust because these are multiple blockchain only makes sense if you have multiple distrustful parties that need to exchange information and that trust that normally in world today is kind of implied if I want to borrow money from you there. You have to trust me, right? That I'll give you the money. We can make write contracts and so on, but at the end of the day, uh, we have to trust each other to a certain degree, which is not normal. People do not want to trust each other just by the sheer fact that we've met. Even worse, in terms of companies, people quite often don't meet. So that trust is what blockchain really helps with. Another interesting example is in food industry. Food industry is really uh, leveraging blockchain very widely and very, is very excited about it because food trust is one of the um, weakest points in general. Um, this is an example of a seafood uh, movement. Uh, there is a company in China uh, that recently joined Hyperledger called JD. Uh, and JD uh, is tracking bananas on a blockchain. So you can actually scan your banana bar, uh, barcode and check where it comes from, what's the provenance. Because in China, um, the uh, honesty in food or food, like the, the provenance of food is very rare. You can actually like buy eggs and it turns out they're made of plastic and things like that. It's in incredible what is happening there. Rice and pork are also tracked through blockchain today to make sure that pork uh, that has been delivered to your house is healthy, it's, it's clean, it has the certification needed. Um, in this case, what I really like about it, and I'll pause here for a moment, is the recognition that blockchain can just help solve part of the problem, but will not solve it all. And it can really improve what the living today, but it won't just solve all of your problems. And here's how it works. So a fisherman logs into his boat uh, through a system. And again, this system has to be secure. It has to be designed completely separately from a blockchain. But you have some kind of an authentication method where a fisherman logs into his boat and goes off to fish, right? Now we install, we are able to install um, IoT devices that uh, track where the boat is and how heavy the nets are that picked the fish. So that we know how much fish was caught and where was it caught, so if it was sustainable or not. Of course, again, the IoT devices and the whole server side of things has to be built securely. And that doesn't matter if it's a blockchain or not blockchain. Um, technology. Uh, we put that information on a blockchain uh, to know that this batch of fish was caught in a sustainable way in a certain place. As the fisherman comes to, um, to, the, uh, to the port again, he, uh, the fish is uh, unloaded to a truck, a container. That container has monitoring system that allows you to verify what are the conditions and time and path that fish went from the port to your Aldi or uh, KDV. Um, now, when the fish arrives to the restaurant, to the supermarket, wherever, and if it is spoiled in some way, we are able to verify if it was too warm in the truck, if it took too long time, or maybe the fish was poisoned altogether from the very beginning because there is some poisoning in the sea. Um, if such thing happens, we are able to execute smart contract in a way that does not, uh, that, that removes all of the dispute and insurance can be paid directly to the people that should get that money. 
All of this means that the auditability uh, drops. There is still need for auditors, but it is not, you know, auditing the auditor or the auditor. Um, the cost of the whole thing is lower because we have lower food waste. The restaurants can plan how many portions of sustainable fish will they be able to, uh, to give to people. And so the cost of a sustainably caught salmon or tuna drops down, which means that all of us are inclined to buy a sustainable tuna versus non-sustainable tuna because they are basically the same price, which means that we are improving the ecology because now everyone's going to go for the sustainable one rather than non-sustainable one. So that's a really interesting thing how technology can really go back and help us uh, and we can help uh, kind of build technologies that save the world and call me cheesy, but I do like improving the world a bit. Uh, but also it shows how much of other factors you have to think about when building a solution. Um, diamond supply chain is an another interesting example because this is a place where um, technology brought us a system with, uh, that was purely paper-based. So traders of diamonds in, uh, f coming from Africa all the way to uh, Amsterdam, where the biggest hub is, um, decided to go with uh, the solution pro pro uh, proposed or suggested by Everledger, um, where this amazing, incredible woman uh, that is CEO of Everledger, uh, just came to them and said, look, and now I saw, offer you a solution where you can track if diamonds are um, from honest areas and what is the quality of diamonds that, that you're getting and that the one that you bought in Africa is the same diamond that comes to you, but you have to adopt this technology. And now I think something like 80% of diamond trade is happening on a blockchain. Um, Digital identity is something that I discussed already and talked a bit. Uh, I promised to talk, tell you 44% of Filipinos are uh, only using bank accounts today. That's because we don't know how to do know your clients in countries like Philippines. So they've partnered with Hyperledger Indy and uh, uh, Ami Han to build a solution that allows you to uh, verify the honesty of your clients and um, kind of their uh, record of uh, banking. Um, green assets management is another uh, example of how can you uh, track the CO2 emission uh, in China and how can uh, you really collaborate. Um, and finally, um, let's see, I want to make sure that I get to the interesting, yeah. Um, so real estate is, will be the last example that I talk about. Um, again, if anyone ever tried b buying a house, you know how horrible it is and how many offices do you have to go to. Um, that with blockchain gets solved because offices, it is a common misconception that uh, governments and institutions without, within governments trust each other, right? Because it's one government. Well, no, they don't. They don't. Uh, they are not able to track the records. They are not able to verify what is happening. So uh, this is a system that allows you to really track that and speed up the process of uh, buying or selling a house. Um, now, all of that um, shows one thing, which is we really need collaboration of blockchain. And this is one of the things that is hampering today's uh, process of uh, exploration, the blockchain space, because we are not able to convince uh, enterprises or enterprises are not convinced that they can collaborate in a safe way. So this is the next big step and the next problem. How do we collaborate? Because doing p proof of concept in your back office uh, and proving that blockchain tech works, yeah, it does. But if you want to really use it and deploy it and scale it up, you need partners from various enterprises, from various open source industries. And then you have to kind of trust the technology, not trust people, but trust the technology. Um, to kind of help you, if because I saw that some people, or th there was a big group here that is not very familiar with blockchain. 
Uh, we have launched a course that is a free open source online course on edX platform like Coursera or like many others, uh, where, which takes you from what blockchain is and what are the different aspects of blockchain all the way to the last stages are uh, coding exercises on how to deploy your blockchain based on Hyperledger Fabric and based on Hyperledger Sawtooth. So it's a really, you know, open to everyone uh, course uh, that I suggest you take if you're interested in the blockchain space. Um, and then one last thing, uh, in Basel, in, uh, yeah, in December, it will be very cold, I can promise you that, but it won't be that much colder than in, the, in Berlin. Uh, we are we have we are hosting an open uh, event, an open conference for everyone, and we hope that by 20, December 2018 we will see a lot of use cases and deployments. And this conference is really focused on deployments. So we are putting a strong effort on both business and technological tracks to talk about what uh, what people are doing. So with that, I'll finish. We still have like two more minutes, so I'll take some questions. And if not, I'm around. I'm wearing a spotty dress, so it's easy to find me in the break. And I can't see you, so I don't know if there are any questions. Mm, I don't think there are. Awesome. Oh, yeah, you here. Yeah, so there are projects like Kubernetes, yeah, like Open Network uh, Solution, um, uh, Open Network on app, <laughs> uh, and of course, yeah, we uh, Linux Foundation hosts and doesn't pick and choose which project is better than the other. We treat all of our children equally. Uh, so if you want to get engaged with projects on databases and centralized uh, databases, that's absolutely fine. In fact, in many cases, when people come to Hyperledger and say, we want to develop with Hyperledger frameworks, we say, do you really need a blockchain? Maybe, maybe there is another solution because there are downsides to blockchain. Okay. Since I don't see any more questions. Oh, there is one. Okay, go on. Or not. Okay. Oh, there, I see one in the back. Yeah, so the way that it works on the blockchain, the question was how do you deal with disappearing resources? Um, blockchain does not allow for deletion in any way. Once you put something on a blockchain, it stays for, in, on a blockchain forever. Um, so, that's the upside of it. It provides immut immutability, but it is also the downside of it because you have to predict what will be the consequences of putting information on a blockchain um, in 10, 20, 50 years time. This is one of the big questions about identity because if we put private information on a blockchain, um, it will last forever, which means that we can you know, play around with encryption, you can do all that magic, but encryption gets broken all the time. And so maybe in, now it's safe, but in 10 years time, people will be able to see, like break the encryption and see your very private information. Now, maybe in 10 years time, it won't be as valuable, but maybe there are things uh, about you that you don't want to reveal ever to anyone that doesn't like, that you don't give them access to it, right? You don't want that information to become public. Does that answer your question? Uh, no, there is no. Uh, th there are ways to deprecate the, uh, the the blockchain, right? Not to pr prevent it from blowing up information. But blockchain is not a database. It is a, an immutable record of events, rather than immutable database, which is a, also a common thing. You don't put, you should not be putting as much information on a blockchain because that's not what it is for. It is, it should serve as an attestation process rather than uh, a storage process. Uh, if you put wrong information on a blockchain, so you know, 
make a claim that is not true, what you can do is you can uh, amend changes and say, well, this information that I put there is incorrect. I'm introducing a delta, a change. But you don't remove that information and replace it with a new one. Okay. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to not see you, I guess. <laughs>